Hey, folks, welcome to Free Press Sports with Carlson and Sean. Carlson, it's good to see you. You look tired, and you should be, because you wrote columns in consecutive days, which is probably a first in your career in the Free Press. I want to applaud you for that. But I also want to know, did you get enough sleep? I, I barely did, Sean. As you know, that's exhausting. That's uh, that's like a pitcher throwing a doubleheader by himself for me, so it's a lot. I'm full of caffeine and coffee, and um, one of our, our, our honored guests today actually lived in Colombia for a while, and I think she knows quite a bit about coffee, so maybe she's our expert here on how to what to drink and how to stay awake. Colombia, the country, or Colombia, South Carolina? The country. Come on, man. Coffee, we're talking Colombia. Who owes? No, but, but Columbia, South Carolina, is not that far from Charleston, and Charleston's the kind of place I could see our guest at. It's a great food scene, interesting you culture. Do you think our guest has anything that? to do with the South, with the American South? That's the I don't know. Charleston's pretty interesting, right? And 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 our guest is a, a human of the world. You know what I mean? She's not going to just write off certain geographic areas. I would I wouldn't think that's not what uh, that's not what Scandinavians do. They embrace everything. So let's get our Scandinavian in here. Thanks for joining us, Helena, St. James. And uh, what, what's, okay, Carlos, I, I saw your column. You're, uh, you, you were surprisingly positive, or at least reasonably positive, so that was that was interesting. But Helena, what the heck is going on with the Red Wings? Well, they went into an absolute swoon in March, for most of March. And now they're playing well again, but they're playing against really good teams that, again, against teams that where their best isn't enough to get a point on most nights, if that. And they squandered their opportunities when they played Arizona, a team far below them in the standings. They Buffalo, I mean, they, they didn't beat the teams they needed to beat below them in the standings. And now they're faced with trying to beat teams above them in the standings and get back inside the playoff picture. And they have really, unfortunately, jeopardized their chances of advancing. Yeah, they. I, you know what, and 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 that's the hard thing, right? Is they they gave themselves that cushion in January when they were really good, and then I think some of that had to do with Dylan Larkin, right? They lot, how many games did they miss him to a lower body injury? It absolutely they they miss him, and it certainly exposed that they you know need more depth at, at at center. They need better better players. They need to bring somebody else in at center. But one player, if you want to consider yourself a good team, you cannot let. One player make that much of a difference, no matter what his name is. So, you know, and and Dylan Larkin, I don't think you can blame starting as poorly as they did in some of those games on, on not having Dylan Larkin. I mean, yeah, matchups can especially be an issue on the road, but some of those games were at home. I mean, the the game at home against Arizona, the game at home against Columbus, which you know they needed twelve seconds left in regulation to pull that out and turn it into a victory. I mean, that was that was not a performance to take any pride in, you know, even though they did eventually win. It's just, it can't only just be that they missed Dylan Larkin. I, I don't know if they, if they didn't, if it was responding to being, to having put themselves, I mean, all they had to do mid-February was just go 500 down the stretch and they, you know, clear a path to the playoffs. And instead now, you know, yeah, they're, they're right there within grasp, but so are half a dozen other teams, and there's seven games left. Isn't that the the thing? I think with with this team, you know, they're just good enough to be competitive and at that level, that playoff bubble level. But they're not they're not the lightning, you know. Who you've even like taken a step back, right? They're getting a little bit older, but they don't have Kucherov and Stamkos and Hedberg, and you know, they don't have that kind of depth down the roster. They have good players but not like amazing players. And they, they do rely on Larkin a lot. I mean, he's such a great two-way player. Obviously, they're captain and everything. Mostly, they're leading scorer until he got hurt. Very productive. And I don't know, how much is that? You, you wrote a good piece today about David Perron, and, you know, he he's such a competitor. Lalone loves him. He always talks about him and all that. And But Larkin kind of fits in that mold too, right? Kind of a leader. And do, do you think they have enough? I mean, they do have a lot of veteran presence in that team the petri you know petri guys and all that stuff but but do they have enough do you think to overcome when you lose a leader like that or a spark plug like Peron in that locker room or, club, or uh, dressing room sorry it's hockey so but do they have that or is it just like you miss one key thing i mean right now i think if you lose patrick kane it's over for them i mean they just they're they're dead in the water without patrick kane 
Well, it's it's interesting, you know, because I, I think you can you can be you can provide leadership and set an example without being a star player. But there's no question. I mean, Larkin provides so much of that and is a star, and Patrick Kane provides it. I think very quietly in the dressing room and you know very clearly on the ice. I mean, that goal he scored in Tampa. That's what got them going, you know. And and in I mean, they should win in Chicago, and they did thanks to him. And they did. They should have beaten Columbus, and, and they did, thanks in large part to him. So I think he's been a terrific addition. David Perron, absolutely. You know that not every guy is vocal. Certainly, you know Steve wasn't a, a vocal guy like that at all. But that's where Perron brings such an intangible. But I do think when when you lose seven in a row and you lose them some other way ways they did, you know it. it, it I mean, you have to examine everything. Was there, you know, leadership lacking there? And certainly the coaching staff gets some blame too. I mean, you know, they, it's, I mean, it's it's partly their responsibility to, too to make sure players players are, are ready and that and are prepared well enough. And you know, if something isn't working. I mean, it was tough to, you know, find somebody to play Larkin's spot. And I think Joe Valeno is. A terrific guy, and he works very, very hard, and he he has a lot of can skate, has really good pace. But he's not, you know, it just wasn't an experiment that should have lasted more than one game to try him up there between Kane and DeBrincat. So, you know, I, I think it's just when when you go from the kind of position they were in to where they are now, you have to you have to look at the coaches as well, what what their responsibility was in that. By the way, one quick thing is Steven Samkos is an un, is a free agent after the season, right? I mean, you know, you know, he was Eiserman's guy, so is that worth going after? No, I, I think it's definitely. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of ton a ton of good players that reach uh, unrestricted free agency. Teams keep their best ones unless they start committing the sin of getting older, and then you know. But but there's no question. I mean, Patrick Kane still uh, an incredible addition and contributor in his mid thirties. David Perron. Closing in on thirty six, still an incredible addition. And you know, he'll the only games if he plays out this this these last seven games, the only ones he will have missed are those six games that if he was suspension suspended in, in December, like the durability is there. You know, Stan Cuss has had some injuries in in his career, but there's no question like when you when you're that intelligent of a player, you can still contribute. And yeah, I absolutely do think of a look at Steven Stamkos in the off season. You know, I, I know sometimes it's frustrating for Wings fans because they don't view, well, most of them don't view Larkin as a top, top tier, you know, first line center, but he's still a really good player. And the domino effect of his absence is is significant on this particular team. And it seems to me that his absence, and you, you, like you said, they lost a couple of games at home, the Arizona game. They're, they have that road trip to Arizona again where they lose, Vegas, whatever. And it just kind of snowballed a little bit. But you're talking about the slow starts. How much of that do you as the coaches? And look, I understand there's a, there are a lot of young guys on the team, but you just mentioned some vets. You know, both those guys you just mentioned and Kane and Piranha won cups. They played high level, high leverage hockey. So so how much of it is the coaches and how much of it is the vets in the room that say, hey, we can't come out and be, you know, have these slow starts where the intensity isn't where it needs to be? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, I think it's, I mean, because it's a team sport, like you yourself may feel like, okay, I'm ready to go. But if it seems like nobody else on the bench, you know, Patrick King kind of described it as like sometimes they were guilty of feeling out, okay, what's the what's the other what's the opponent going to bring? What's the opponent going to play like? And then responding to that instead of in the games where they play well and win, they're the ones who come out, you know, and, and you can tell from the opening shift, like skating, being physical, cycling the puck. You know, it's not. It doesn't mean mistake-free hockey. It just means, you know, to me, it's just so easy to tell whether a team is is playing with energy or not. Absolutely. So I, I want to go back to your Larkin not being viewed as a. That's that's all fine and good, but how many teams who have a star center didn't draft him? Like you get those because you get to draft them, you know. And the wing, like a top line, top elite center. And the Wings just, they have, you know, I mean, the, the draft lottery has been so hard for them. And, you know, they, they went that, you know, I mean, 15, 16, 18 of their first round picks not panning out. So, and Steve, Steve, I mean, knows that better than anybody. When he was 
winning cups, you know, their depth was Eisenman, Fedorov, uh, Larianov, like Draper, you know, like that's your center depth. I mean, you're never going to match that, but that's what he was used to from his playing days. And now, you know, I mean, you're stuck trying to fill holes in free agency, or maybe if you get lucky, trade for somebody. But those elite, elite centers, if you don't, if you're not able to, dra- to draft one, it's almost impossible to get a hold of one. Carlos, can I ask a real quick follow-up sure. to that? Uh, Elena, what do you – I'm curious what you think. So, yes, okay, fine. Larkin's not you know, one of the best two, three centers in the league, whatever. Are they good en- – I mean, is he good enough to be a uh, front-line center, first-line center on a team that gets to a cup, that makes a cup run, if – the second line center is there, maybe the third line center. If the scoring is is on the on the either side of the second line center is there, if the goaltending's fine, if the defense is a little bit better, a little bit more physical, Edmondson works out, whatever. I mean, can you see a path just through depth and improving some of the pieces around, especially the defense, to where Larkin's good enough to be the one A guy on a cup team? Okay, I think that counted six, five or six ifs there. I know, I so know. you spot any team in five or six <laughs> ifs. Sure, sure, absolutely. Then then uh, he can he can be that iffy team to a cup when they if and when they get all those other categories taken care of. Or do you think you have to have one of those guys you're talking about? No, I not if you have, you know, every all those other ifs you talked about, but I mean where where are you getting them? And and Dylan is already in his late twenties, so I, you know, I just think it's not fair to put it all on where you slot, where you slot Dylan, and he's certainly proven how incredibly important he is to this team. But you know, let's shift some of the attention to Alex Jabrinkat. I think he has like seven points his last fifteen, sixteen since since that winning streak at the end of February came to an end. I mean, and yeah, he hits posts, but like that's not good enough from a player who's being paid, you know, to score like like he is. So. You know that that's. I mean, they they need like like Derek keeps saying they need everybody going, and that's where they are with seven games left. I think that I mean, I, the break it probably like leads the league in goalpost hit or whatever in that in that cold stretch. But you know the the thing. I mean, uh, to play devil's advocate, the Golden Knights won the Stanley Cup last year, and Jack Eichel they traded for him. You know, as a center, so you can you can find some motivated people. Goalies, obviously, you can get them. You can trade for them. You can acquire them. You can, you know, that that can happen. Now, you have to give things up, obviously, and that's that's a question. I, I, that's where Iserman hasn't, I don't think, done. I could be wrong, but I don't think he's made a high-leverage trade, a big... Well, imp- Alex Debrinkat was. I mean, Debrinkat was a But a who did he trade? Who did trade. he give up to get Debrinkat? He gave, he gave, didn't he give up Boston's pick? No, a player. I mean, like a, a key player or a key, No, you know, he, he gave he gave up... Yeah, well, I mean, he he gave up who isn't who isn't a high, but but they're no. they're not in that position, right? Uh, That's what I'm saying is though, it hasn't come to that where you've had to trade like significant assets. And he says this, you know, the thing about draft picks is but, you but don't know. But a first round pick, a first round pick is a significant asset. Yeah, and they traded that it in can to be. get. Oh, it is. I mean, a first round pick that's. That's an important piece to have in play in, in in any trade. So, but they're not in the position where they can give up. You know, a, a Simon Edmondson type prospect. They're they're just not. They those players are way too important to the rebuild to start flipping those for for established players just yet. Yeah, that's the question. Is just when 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 are we going to get to that point? You know, when is if you if you never make a trade like that, if you never give up an Edmondson for whatever a better offensive player or whatever, however you want to characterize it, whatever you need, an elite goalie, you know, you know, whoever it might be, someone who there's a deficiency there. When you make that risk, when you make that huge decision, you know, when are we going to get there? Because this this rebuild been going on for, what, now five years, right? Under Iserman. So is it five or six now? It's five. Yeah, five for him. Five Five for for him. And at some point, you know, you don't get any, you don't get things for nothing. And even the draft picks you mentioned, you know, Ariana, I bet they weren't high draft picks. Obviously, it was the Russian thing, whatever, but a little bit different model. Well, you can't, you can't compare yeah, drafting Fedorov to the position right. you're in nowadays. That was, that was, that was just more to say, like, wow, were they ever, you know, <laughs> had a lot of stars down the middle? But no, but I mean, yeah, those, those, 
w- when do they get them? Well, partly when are they presented? You know, I mean, it's it, you know the Eichel thing was unique to Brinkhead. There, the Wings had the advantage of Ottawa pretty much had to trade him, and Brinkhead is from Michigan, so he right. wanted you know to, to come play for the Red Wings. So sometimes situations like that work to your advantage. Patrick Kane wanted to come play in, in Detroit, so you know. But I just i I don't think you can fault Steve for much. I think he's done an incredible job, and he's incredible, incredibly hardworking and thorough in everything he does. And, you know, to me, he absolutely made the right decision at the trade deadline in not, I mean, again, they're not in a position where they're going to move somebody, you know, a, a top end prospect to get a player. And they already have had depth, depth position. They're already carrying three goalies. So, you know, now I don't think anybody could have anticipated that they were going to go say, thanks, Steve and play absolutely horrible that night right. in in Arizona and then continue that for like, you know, another handful of games before before waking up. But I I, I mean, I think Steve's Steve's done a, a terrific job, you know, and I think people who doesn't want to forget twenty twenty, right? I mean, the toilet paper wars. So that was a terrible team. That was a terrible team he took over. I mean, it was just I don't I don't think half the players on the on that team weren't in that in the league next year, you know. So he's so what he's done without again ever having any luck in the draft lottery to me really is quite remarkable. Did we uh, before before we let you go, Alina, because we don't want to keep you all day, and that, it's my fault because I was a little bit late to this party. But can we spin this forward a little bit? I, I want I, I, maybe we don't need a hard prediction, but what do they have? Seven games left. Seven games left. Seven games left. They're tied with Washington, right, as we speak, in terms and of points. And 82 points, but Washington has a game in hand on them, which... It's a tiebreaker. Yeah, they have the tiebreaker. So, right. So how many points do you think they need over these next seven games to get that last spot? Because it seems like the, the other yeah. wild card spot is too far to reach at this point. No, I mean, the, the second wild card is really their only realistic, realistic chance. But, you know, again, like... They were in the first wild card spot in in February. Like that's how far, and and they were they were only like four points behind Toronto for third in the division. I mean, it looked a lot more hopeful now. You know what? So Florida got in last year on ninety two points. Given that nobody has really run away with anything this late in the season, I wouldn't be surprised if it only takes ninety points, maybe ninety ninety one. So there's fourteen available to them. I mean, I keep thinking. Oh, I still think they can make it in. They can make it in. But when you look at it like, okay, they may, they may need eight to 10 points with 14 available. <laughs> that leaves no room for error, right? And the Rangers are still playing for first overall. I mean, they have a lot to play for. Buffalo always plays them hard and tech really are still hanging on and certainly will just want to stick it to the wings. Washington next Tuesday that's that's as it stands right now. That's a that's a big one. Huge. Then you go you go into Pittsburgh and the Penguins. I mean, Sidney Crosby's doing everything he can to to get the Penguins in as well. Your best bet is maybe by next Saturday, Toronto is locked into third and can rest their guys. And then you have Montreal, which is out of it. But you know, it's not. I mean, the next five games at least are all against teams. You know, in the playoff picture or just within striking distance like Detroit. So, you know, I, I go back to they, they've just they've put themselves in a really, really tough position. And I think <clears throat> I think it's going to be very, very hard for them to. But but I think it's also going to be hugely disappointing if they don't, considering where they were. This to me is much more disappointing uh, if if they end up missing this year than than last year. So four wins, you think four wins does it? I think eight points may do it. I mean, I guess there are other ways to get eight points and just four straight wins. Yeah, a but... point at a time. You know, get two and then keep pushing past regulation. So if they can, if they can take care of Montreal both times, that's and then four. Uh, and then knock the Capitals off, right? And then that, pick that's one... going to be huge. That's going to be one right. of those. And they're home for that. There should be some electricity in the building that night, I would think. And then and then so, one more. So I know you guys have brunch with Dan Cam- Dan Campbell on. On a regular basis, when is she coming over to, you know, sound the gold horn before games and 
give give Derek his 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 you could do it speech because I think so, that's that's what the wing the wings need. Some so of this my is the lion's magic. So this is the lion's fault. That's this is what this is what I'm hearing, Carlos. It's, it's your fault for not getting you know the pipeline across Woodward and yeah, I don't think they have some of that. The biggest misunderstanding about Dan Campbell is he's like Newt Rockney and. You don't want Dan Campbell giving you a rah-rah speech because nobody's going to understand it. He's going to throw ACDC in there, something about serpents and eels drowning in water. And the guys are just going to be confused about like, what is he talking about? Yeah, that's not the, ma- that's not the, the, that's not Dan Campbell's strong suit. Really. <laughs> it would be entertaining though. And it's, it's been a little, what did the kids say? Thirsty on Lalone's part to try to get, he always asked for Dan Campbell and all this stuff to come and. Yeah, I think. Well, you know what though, I do, I do think. I mean, when they were winning, it was a Lions player that sounded the goal horn before the game. James so, Williams. Yeah, and so, then Ben Johnson, right? Yeah, and then yeah. Ben Johnson. So I, I think, I think, I think you got to take mercy on the wings and cross Woodward Avenue and 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 show up, show up Friday night and Sunday and whatever help they can. I mean, let's be honest, we all would like to see them make it, right? I mean. It's so much fun to see the Red Wings in the playoffs. It's been way too long, and it's and to me, you say like, okay, they can just get in, but like, you get in. I mean, Florida just got in last year, and then you know rolled along, smoked. Okay, I don't know if they're going to be. Are they going to beat New York or Boston or Florida in the first round? I mean, teams can do it, but it's usually there's something weird. Yeah, but at least, but but like, okay, you would also have said. No way are they going to lose both games to Arizona. And like they did, you know, I mean, like there is a reason to are play the right? games I and mean, don't just, hurt. we're not going to go back over this again, but. Well, that's what I'm saying is injuries and stuff like that plays a, a role, right? Sometimes and definitely right, in the but, but playoffs. like just get in, just get in. And it's, no, you, know, you're right. and you don't Elena's, know what can happen. Like Lion you don't stole, has Sean, stolen so many points. Sean thinks that this is all, he loves the word puck luck. He just thinks that no, all hockey is it's puck not, luck. So. It's, no, but, it, but Helena's right. This is by, I mean, baseball, we see a little bit of this, but hockey is by far the one sport where the eight seed yeah. has the best chance at the, at the one seed. The NFL maybe some years too, but, but in hockey, we see it Almost every year, the low, their lower seeds win every year. Exactly, exactly. There's always an upset. There's always an upset. So, so, so that's all Helena's is saying, Carl. Is you it, never know. It's also, she's not saying it's going to happen. She's saying you never it's know. Possible. Just get it. Sure, in. anything's possible. You could be on time for a change. That's possible. But the the biggest thing I worry about here is here's what's the the scary scenario because I'm always the doomsayer is for the wings is they get close, right? They beat Buffalo. They get a point or two here. You know, maybe the Caps. Ooh, they beat the Caps. You know, here we go. And then the ace plant against Montreal, the last two games, home and away. And that would be the worst possible. And then they got to sit there. I think, Helene, you were talking about the schedule and there's some games yeah. that are played after. They could possibly have played themselves out by face planting against the Canadians and then have to watch as another team controls yeah, their destiny. Yeah, because Pittsburgh and the Islanders play... That Wednesday, April seventeenth, the Wings finish up the sixteenth, but there are still NHL games Wednesday and Thursday, and one of those. So as it stands right now, P- Penguins and Islanders. I mean that that potentially could be huge. So there is a scenario in which maybe the Wings don't know yet when when they finish. In real realistically, they probably they probably do. But it, um, it, here, here's the main thing with this this back to back Montreal series. It's a Monday night what at Little Caesars and then Tuesday night in Montreal. I hope you take or have booked an early enough flight on that Tuesday so you can go get a decent lunch in in one of the your probably favorite cities on the tour, right? I do like Montreal a lot. You know, it's it's that's that's crunch time. So we'll I think you'll. Take I'll your laptop it. to a little cafe. <laughs> let me cafe, let me ask yeah. you this, you know, because there's been some chatter from from, and you brought it up with the coaching and some. How much do they, you know, blame or whatever it is, responsibility do they bear in this? There's been some chatter about the loan. A lot of fans aren't happy. Some fans aren't happy letting this happen, right? And the promise and whatever. Could he, if they face plant here on the way out, seven games, and they're they they don't win, even if they're you know, somewhat competitive. They've been fairly consistently competitive, at least. But if they don't win at the end here and they just, you know, trip over them, you know, leak oil on the way to the finish here, could there be some concern about him entering next year? I, I certainly think, uh, again, it's he's 
he he just the, the coaching staff deserves some criticism and some examination over you know why that losing streak went on for as long as it did and and why they looked as bad as they did. So, you know, Steve certainly has shown no impetus to make rash decisions or anything, and you know understands. You know, I mean, again, he knows what, what the center depth was like when he played, and he knows what it's like now. And then, you know, I think you brought it up earlier. The Wings are certainly nobody's Stanley Cup contender, you know, but they did impress upon all of us that, hey, they could make the playoffs. They really were in good position to make the playoffs. So to see this slide now, it's disappointing. And I think, you know, p- part of that is on the coaching staff. What, why, you know, why why they're now with seven games left on the outside and trying to get back in when it looked like for sure this was going to be a year. And they should, you know, they should be better this year. They absolutely should finish with with more points and than last year. I mean, Steve brought in, you know, Patrick Kane and Alex Dabrinkat alone. I mean, he brought in, he really made pretty significant changes and, you know, yeah, Vila Huso was barely played this season, but Alex Lyon has saved their bacon and is a huge reason why they're even in the spot. You know, so in in Dylan missed a stretch, but they haven't been ravaged by injuries like they have in previous seasons or other teams have. So I just think, you know, mo- mostly, I mean, that they, they should be significantly better this season than they were last year and I think we've seen it for most of the season but now you know I mean like they're, they're the ones who have always said they want to be in this position and and Dylan brought it up Monday you know that they finally seem to have settled down and calmed down a little I mean maybe they did the pressure did they did kind of buckle under the pressure that's certainly what it looked like based on on some of the results they got so Elena before uh, before we let you go actually we're gonna we're gonna keep you around for the the what, what do we call it, Carlos? My favorite thing, that segment of the show, because we want to know what Elena's favorite thing is. But before we get to that, can you uh, can you tell us about your books and what you get going? Yeah, so um, the exciting thing is there's one coming out in October called The Franchise, all about a uh, curated look at the Red Wings and their just tremendous, tremendous history. But if you can't wait that long, the Big 50, the men and moments that made the Detroit Red Wings is still available. You can email me, hstjames at freepress.com. Always happy to be personalized and send the books out myself. Or you can get them at a bookstore. And also the on the clock, behind the scenes at the draft with the Detroit Red Wings back when there was no draft lottery. and and But there was an iron curtain and they weren't afraid of the iron curtain. That's, that's, all, that's what that book is about. So... They're both fantastic reads, and uh, I think a playoff a playoff run would only add to the, the yes. reading interest, right, for yeah. fans. <laughs> no, no question, no question. All right, on that positive note, let's uh, let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more free press sports with Carlson Show. <laughs> Welcome back to Free Press Sports with Carlos and Sean. All right, let's move from one of your favorite sports to the, your other favorite sport. And I'm, I can never remember which one is which. I think baseball's the time. Highlight. But man, okay. the, the, uh, uh, highlight. Okay, there we go. As we record, the Tigers are 4 0. We got opening day coming up Friday. They've won mostly with pitching, but with also some timely hitting. I don't even know if there's such a, you're not even allowed to say timely hitting in baseball anymore. The, <laughs> the numbers say it doesn't matter. All hits are the same. It's first inning. It's just as timely as the ninth inning. And by the math, that's true. By the by the by the math, that's true. So, but you know, if you get a hit with a runner on second or third, and you get a hit with nobody on base, that's a little bit different, right? I mean, I think that's what we mean by timely. But we're not here to debate saber metrics, which is not even a word we use anymore. We're here to talk about this start and that the the Tigers are apparently not going to lose. They're going to go 162 and 0. That's right. They're they're uh, what one one whatever one and one point five percent away, whatever. Man, to getting there. <laughs> well, you can't yeah, you no. can't win them all until you win the first, and you win. They won the first four, so they're, they're no for way. sure. You you you've seen them a lot. You've watched them a lot. You're a really nice column about Jason Benetti, the the new Tigers play by play television play by play announcer, and you watched a lot to listen to him. But you also that means you had to watch baseball. So yeah, what do you what do you think? You've 
you've had your eye out there. What's your what's your sense? I mean, and by the way, we got a holiday coming up on Friday. I mean, in, in Detroit, it's opening day is a big big deal, and especially now that it's on a Friday, the drunkenness level is going to be even more over the top. I still every time I, you say that, and I think about opening day, I think of Jim Schaefer writing a column. The old, basically, you're stealing your thunder as the undercover fan, walking over all, counting all the drunk people he was stepping over, like walking around on the side outside of America. Yeah, it's no, uh, it's it's quite a scene, and this is a Friday. <laughs> Just keep in mind, this is a Friday. A Friday. It's not a Tuesday. Hey, usually, it's, it's a Thursday. Yeah, and in fact, by the way, I'm I'm sorry to disappoint you, Sean, but I'm going to have to cut out early because I accidentally, accidentally, and apologize to to our boss, Kirkland Crawford. I promise we'll get a second mention later on in the podcast that I'm going to have to cut out early because I booked a different thing, a personal event later early that night, not just this is months ago, not realizing the Tigers were not going to start on a Thursday like they normally do. And then they take Friday off, you know, it's their p- potential rain makeup day or whatever for hope for the home opener, but they're weirdly starting on a Friday. So yeah. Pop open those those cans and and get ready for some partying. And no, I'm bummed, man. I'm bummed. Let's be let's be real. I heard a couple of days ago you weren't going to be there Friday. I'm like, God, it's. Oh, I'll be there. I'll be there. Just not as long as I normally. Oh, would. so you will be there. I okay. will be there. I just have to split real quick. I gotta. So are you going to write? No, oh, yeah, I'll be writing there. I'll be. Okay. I'll be doing something. Okay. Okay, good. So okay. we get to spend a lot of time because, you know, base- I miss it. Yeah, because baseball is. Go ahead. Sorry. It's a long day. You got to get there three and a half hours before first pitch and all that. And it's a, it's a long day for the for the old press corps. But, uh, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I was, I was I'm like, Carlson's going to be there. You know, I, I don't, I, I think it was an opening day last year. And then maybe the first time in a while, maybe maybe the year before, but, but I had a long stretch where I missed opening day all the time because of the NCAA tournament. And, uh, you know, that was glorious, <laughs> but now, now I've got to go to opening. I like I like the, the atmosphere. Thing. I appreciate it as a fan, as a you know. The, the, I like to see that the, the people are happy, and also let's not let's not kid ourselves that the, the, they're not going to be this good for very long. They have a really soft schedule to open the season, which is why it's happening. But it's they're going to it's going to be some real dry patches here, and especially until the kids get out of school and it's summer, you know, for the next, you know, whatever through mid April into May and a little bit into June, you know, probably it's going to be some, some quiet stadiums at Comerica, quiet crowds. So it's nice to see one, one big, you know, sellout crowd and everybody's into it and hopefully it's not raining. Or- no, yeah, no, it'll, it'll be, it's a great scene. It's one of the best days of the year if you're a sports fan. In Detroit, obviously, and they have an interesting young team, relatively young anyway. They've got they've got some decent pitching. Their bullpen looks good. Their ace, he's really, really fun to watch. It's fun to watch a hard throwing lefty who can move the ball around like Terry Scoobel does. You know, their their young bats are we'll see. You're right. It's early. You know, you, you just you just don't know. You just don't know. But uh, I know i we've written about Cole Keith for 50 days straight he's he's about to be <laughs> he's about to be in the hall of fame no it's a it's fun, batting, it's fun when you have, batting zero eight three he's going to be in the hall of fame yes he's, yeah no, no it's, it's fun it's fun to see you know when young <laughs> young guys come up their prospects i mean it's like torkelson and and riley green a few years ago when they remember the anticipation when they yes. finally got up and but it but you know it takes a bit too yeah and nobody it'll figures out baseball quickly no, 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 no. Maybe Daryl Strawberry, if we're if we're gonna, if we're going to go way back, or Doc Gooden was really good at a really young age. But uh, I don't know why I keep mentioning Mets. I played the Mets. That's why. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe you should be maybe in Queens right it. now. Maybe that's it with the great Rob Parker, who I used to see in that press box when I would drive back when I was driving with the Tigers. He would just randomly show up at Mets games in Queens. He was from Queens, <laughs> and he loved and baseball. Sean, is with Rob Parker, Sean, yeah, how yeah. you doing? Yeah, yeah, Rob, Rob Parker. Parker. Who just baseball is his favorite sport too? By the, by the way. way, everybody everybody in the sports media can do a, a, a Rob Parker impression. Maybe not you, Sean, but most no, most I can't. Of us. No, I, I, I don't. Do I don't do <laughs> but no, it's uh, it's interesting. It should be fun, and uh, yeah, would, they're off to a great start. And then, by the way, got a pretty good announcer, new announcer on TV. You know the thing with Benetti, and since I wrote that piece, I've gotten people love the talk about announcers. That's why I, I wrote it. Really, is like I, you know, they'll seeing some. 
chatter about uh, Benetti and I wrote a column about him the first time he, he called the game in spring training, but it was a different animal that first spring training game, you know, it's just, it's crazy banana town and spring training with all the different guys coming in and out of the lineup. So this is a real game, you know, the first three games in Chicago, it's got a good sense of it. People have so many opinions and they're strong opinions. It's personal to them of listening. And, and that's the thing. It's a, it's a ubiquitous, it's a constant Baseball is every single day, pretty much, you know, and that's why these announcers, I mean, baseball announcers mean more. I mean, I think, I think Ken Daniels for, for my money, Ken Daniels, the Red Wings, Valley Sports, play by play guys, one of the best in the business and anything. I mean, it's so hard to call hockey. He does such a great job blending, you know, the, the action with some history, with some local connections with, you know, it doesn't miss a beat. And I grew up, I really liked Bob Miller when I was growing up with the Kings. He's in the Hall of Fame for hockey. But Benetti sounds like baseball. He just has this, there's guys, Brian Anderson with the Brewers. There's this weird kind of, it's hard to explain with this smoothness, this cadence, this, you know, and I wrote, when I wrote the column about Benetti earlier, one thing I mentioned was, someone had mentioned this to me, another broadcaster had said this and said, I was asking about Matt Shepard, who they fired, the Tigers fired him, you know, or Bally Sports technically fired him, I guess. And you know, the person said to me, you know, uh, it's like boxing uh, styles make fights. And I think that Shepard's style just wasn't the baseball style, the, the, the easy going, the kind of almost languid thing, you know, and, and it, there's just something different about baseball, how you call it, you know, and you can't be too intense. You got to be interesting. You got to tell stories. You got to have fun. You got to also call the action, but not too much, not too many stats. All this is, it's difficult and you got to do it every single day. So it's a tough, tough job. And Benetti just hits a lot of those notes. He's not perfect. There's, I brought up some things I wasn't crazy about, a little bit too much jokey, jokey time sometimes, but he's, he's fun. He's got a really good wit. He's really quick and it just, it's just easy to listen to. You know, I don't know if you've caught much of his of his stuff so far, but not, not a, not a whole game, but I've heard him. No, he's, it, yeah, his, and his the complaints, voice is great. The emails I got, the complaints I got, they really, they weren't har- too harsh because normally people will just lay in, you know, <laughs> you're sending an email, you'll just lay into people because you don't care, you're behind the keyboard. But people haven't been that, any any critical comments haven't been that bad. So so it's a it's a nice, I miss, I don't think Matt Shepard should have lost his job, but I think Benetti's, you know, a really suitable replacement. Well, that's good. And it was a good piece. And I would urge y'all to to check out what Carl wrote about Jason Benetti on Tuesday, I want to say. Tuesday? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to say. Tuesday, I, want to say I, I want to say. I think, I think it rained It came Tuesday, out Tuesday. It came out Tuesday, yeah. It did. So, all right. Before before we take our break here and eventually get to our favorite thing, I, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. And, and this probably deserves, I mean, shoot, we can do the whole podcast on this. And maybe it deserves its own section. But I just I just want to get your, your quick, immediate reaction. I don't know how much you watched the college basketball women's tournament. I don't know how much you've paid attention to what's going on with Iowa, Caitlin and Clark. LSU, and Angel Re- Kim Mulkey. LSU and Kim Mulkey. Angel Reese Angel taking Reese. out her contacts. Putting it, exactly. Them in. Yeah, just, just Very, all this. Not that much, but go ahead. I don't know if you saw the numbers. It was <laughs> the LSU-Iowa game was almost 13 million viewers, which is just a staggering number. And it's just it's it's growing and growing and growing, which is really fabulous. Here's my quick question. Do you think we're ever going to get to the point where we can talk about women athletes like we do about men and just give them the same grace? You know, we, we, cause it's just, it's just, it's been everywhere the last couple of weeks and which is good overall. But, but I feel like as a sports writing, sports writers, broadcasters, whatever, and broadcasters may be a little bit different, but just, do, do you think, do you think women's sports are going to be get, are going to get popular enough that we can just, sort of treated all the same for better and for worse. Ember is a long time. It will get better, but I think that I don't think we're going to see something like this continue because I think Caitlin Clark is a singular entity. We're not likely to see someone like her anytime soon. Maybe I hope we do. I hope we do see somebody. I think a woman who comes in and is the Michael Jordan, the LeBron James and plays above the rim. I think that would change a lot of things. But I also think with women's sports, the minute, and you said the same grace, and I think the opposite of that almost has to be true, where you have to 
teach, play, or or treat the sport, women's college basketball, you have to treat it with the same ferocity, the same ugliness, and and you know that that the men's sport does. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the men's sport. You know, in, in college basketball and in the NBA, and and you don't see it reflected in women's sports and the the harshness with which you know the men are treated. And it's just part of the, at least the American sports culture, dealing with that, that kind of, and you know, a lot of that is because there's a lot of money involved and a lot of attention and a lot of, you know, media and, and the whole, I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing with that LSU guy with thing was, was a rematch. Plus you had the Kim Mulkey, the, the, the coach under fired LSU and this big Washington post piece that was coming out and she went on the screen and people were joking well that just got them fifteen thousand, you know more subscribers you know right. and and you need that you need that kind of you need angel reese doing the john cena thing you need a villain you need you need fire you need people fighting back you need anger you need you know profanity you need fights you need you know you can't spare it you can't have and i think there's a lot of just assumptions sometimes that women couldn't be that that there should be this propriety within that gender that we don't you know that that we don't apply to the men's sports they have to be treated equally and that means equal ugliness and difficulty and strain and and i don't know if we're going to get there equal criticism that has nothing to do with the gender absolutely that's the you have to be able to look past it but i don't know if we can as a culture look past that and treat the sport because it would be wonderful if we did if we gave that no it would it would be it would be great to get there. And I've just thought a lot about it. You're right. And Kaylee Clarks don't come around, around very often. But overall, the women's game has been been trending, especially at the college level, has been trending. And Kaylee Clark has sort of skyrocketed. And maybe she has a singular force. It's interesting because I was trying to think about this over the weekend, Carl's, but the women's sports that have, where they've been equal in terms of television audience, where we don't really differentiate. And the only two I, I've really seen in my lifetime in terms of the cultural impact uh, with men, basically, and some women, are tennis, where a lot of times, you know, Serena or whoever else is drawn bigger than and certainly any American male, and 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 even Roger Federer and Nadal and those guys. So tennis and in soccer, at least here, you know, at least with the World Cup, the Olympics, and that and that and that sort of level. So I don't know that the professional leagues here are the same, but. You know, when, could basketball ever get there? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's fun to watch them play. If you like hoops, you know, it's 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 well, interesting. I think you can answer your own question in some way because you have the answer to it. When she set the women's NCAA scoring record, she did it against Michigan and she did it in Iowa City. You weren't there. You should have. If if we really were close to this, you would have been there. You know, you're you're a predominant college basketball columnist. And I don't know where you you were. I think covering a men's game, you know, I was. And yeah. to me, I I think I mentioned it to you. And you were like, oh no, I this I had to go to the men's thing. You know, it was a important whatever it was. You know, and and I'm sure that was true. But this was history. And I even thought, I wonder if we should go there. I don't know if that would have been a consideration. That's you know, kind of well, you know, no, we you don't think about spending necessarily. How many it, eyeballs we should have had. We should have. No, it was too bad that we couldn't. I had. I was about to have a similar. I mean, I could have potentially. I did have a similar situation a couple of weeks ago with the men's, and with uh, Michigan State and Oakland trying to figure out. And if they'd both won and gotten to the Sweet Sixteen, that would have been an interesting discussion and tough. And it comes down to that's not a gender difference, obviously, but you're 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 thinking about readers and so forth and that audience. I mean, that's what this is really about, right? You're thinking about for us, it's about audience. Yeah, you know. and, and part part of that too, and whether it's us or television or any other, you know, media, it's too many times. It's like, well, you don't know if, if the audience is there if you don't explore it, if you don't give it a chance. So true, and you, so true. you have to consider that. And I, I'd wonder because you know, obviously, Michigan, Michigan State hockey were playing against each other in the tournament, NCAA tournament, and the licensing State Journal was there. You know, our our BFF, Graham Couch, was there, plus our, you know, their their Michigan State beat writer was there to cover it outside of St. Louis for who knows what reason they were there, but playing it there. But that, I'm sure, did really well for Lansing State it, Journal. What it did, did have done the same for us, you know? That's a that's a good question. Graham and I actually talked about that. It, the hockey stuff does really well for them. Yeah, and, but what uh, it do as well for us, and that's another... But you don't know. 
you don't know unless you explore it. And we used to have the wonderful George Sippel who covered a lot of college hockey. Yeah, we used to go to Frozen Forest. To your point about George, we used to cover softball championships. We had a beat writer, I want to say Mark Snyder, former Free Press beat writer. Maybe it wasn't Mark, maybe it was somebody else. But we went to Oklahoma City when, when Carol Hutchins led the Michigan softball team to, to the national championship. So, and yeah, a lot, of, a, a lot of things have changed. That's interesting. And, 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 and that, this is before metrics. This is before we could quantify things. And not only us, but all media has advanced, you know, analytics that tell us a lot of things about audience. But it is true that you have to sort of do a little bit of work on let's let's try this. Let's see what happens. And actually, I don't know if that's still Carol Hutchins isn't the coach anymore. I don't believe right at Michigan. But when she was and they were rolling, I mean, they had a pretty good audience and Almost Mark Snyder would write almost anything about Michigan softball and it no, would use. No, for sure. And I and I I part of my favorite thing is wrapped up in this a little bit, going to Little Caesars Arena for an NCAA basketball game. And and it just it's interesting about do do you cover that if there's no local team? You know, and we yeah. had we had some discussions, right? And so, so we'll talk about this little yeah, I think we said three people, actually. I, three people. I, I'll talk about that. I, I want to save most of this for my favorite thing and what that experience was like. But just in terms of the, the business decision, the newspaper, the journalism decision, you know, we don't cover these events in our own backyard like we used to. And I don't think you, you know, it's interesting because I thought of when I thought about that, I thought about, you know, like the Indianapolis Star, right? That's also in our Gannett company. And they have stuff all the time in Indianapolis. I think you'd have to have your own a whole separate beat writer just to cover all the out of town things that are going on. So would. how do they do it? You know, we don't host quite as many things, but yeah, it's, I'm always for covering a little bit more than less. So that's, you, you know, you wrote a really interesting column about that. And, and it was true. You, you, when I read the, when I read about it, you know, talking about Purdue and how long it's been and thinking just the big 10 gets so many teams in the tournament every year and they haven't won the whole thing in almost a quarter century since Michigan State. And, you know, the thing is, the the, the other wonderful thing is the NCAA and its brilliance has done such a good job branding the tournament and that every round, the first round, Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Final Four, and I think you brought up Final Four, and Final Four means nothing. They're just semifinals. Who cares? You're only the third or fourth loser if you lose in one of those two games. You know, as opposed to, but not in that sport, right? That's but the in that one sport, sport the where final four means something. Matters. You made it to it the does. final four to the, you know, it's funny. But they, they hang, hang banners. Also, you hang banners. Yeah, right? you hang banners. But who, you know, who remembers? Even if you hang banners for the, you know, who won ever, whoever won the baseball American League pennant, does anybody really remember who who lost the pennant? Does you know? People, no, it's no, not. It's a World Series. No. That's all it is, really. You know, and yeah. So it's just funny. The the final four. You know, it's a. Yeah, and, and I think it, I think it's a numbers game, right? There are 200 schools, and you get four or whatever, 160, whatever Division One schools. There are a lot in basketball, so so you get four teams there. That's the, maybe it's just the math. Whereas in pro leagues, you're talking about 30, 32 teams or whatever, so the, it's not the, quite the same. But you no, know, you're right. A Final Four matters a lot to fan bases. It's, it's yeah, you know th- that's why the Purdue Purdue fans at Little Caesars weren't crying. Because they won, they, they didn't win a national championship. They were sobbing because they could do a Final Four. I mean, it's really something. <laughs> oh, so one one question I have to end this, if you if you don't mind answering this, is as much as 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 much as you gave Purdue and Matt Painter is doing everything. Who wins? Do they are they not are they beating NC State and then losing to UConn? I don't think. I, yeah, I, it's hard to see them beating UConn. UConn is just the way. However, they're they're if they can beat NC State, I mean NC State's on one of those rolls that teams get. You know, everybody thinks, oh, okay, Purdue did this, it's an accomplishment. And here comes NC State out of nowhere, right? They were sort of off the radar for most of the season. They won the ACC tournament, upset North Carolina, got lucky and against they, Oakland. I mean, I mean, Oakland had the ball with its high game in twelve seconds, left and a chance to beat NC State, and that happens. There's the often made a, a terrible call, so they lost. There's it. often this a could title be Oakland team. right now. Oakland could be playing yeah. Purdue. You could very, be in, where's the final four? Phoenix. You could be in Phoenix uh, right Phoenix. now, Sean, covering your very Golden Grizzlies. Rarely, wouldn't that be something? Very rare. God, what a story that would have been. Very rarely, very rarely do you have a title team that didn't go through what NC State went through. Hold on, right? I mean, it's every now and again. Surviving advance, I hear. 
from yeah, that. Yeah, now every now and again, a team will run through and blast everybody. Connecticut did that a year ago and might do that this year. Who knows? But we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, looking forward to it. And I'm going to have to watch Kalen Clark and, and uh, the the Iowa Hawkeyes and see how the, how far that, that, that continues. And it'd be amazing they to play see Connecticut, a champion. Right. Yeah, they'll they play, play Connecticut. UConn. And Paige Buckers, who was out a couple of years, who's also really, really fun to watch. He wouldn't have been quite at Kalen Clark's level in terms of popularity and fame, but if she hadn't been hurt the last couple of years, but she was the fresh player of the year as a freshman, she was great, and they got hurt. So that's a good story, too. Anyway, lots one of fun quick, stuff. One quick question. I'm sorry. One last thing just for you is, is she going to do anything to help the WNBA help transform that league and make it Kaylin something Clark, more? That, 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 that's what they need, right? I mean, there have been... There've been Big, big college women's stars before, and they yeah. get to the WNBA, and it doesn't. I mean, going all the way back to Diana Taurasi, right? It, 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 it just doesn't. Rebecca Lobo, have, all these, yeah. Yeah, Brianna Stewart recently. I mean, I mean, you know, yeah, you can go, basically go back and look at UConn's teams <laughs> and all the stars, but, but there have been plenty of others. I mean, Sh- Shamika Holesclaw, I'm trying to think of, you no, know, Cheryl Swoops just goes way, way, way back. But Candace Parker, big, big star at Tennessee. They just... It, it just and the WNBA's numbers have gotten better, but in terms of maybe the kind of growth they'd love to see, who knows? Maybe it'll take Kayla Clark. We'll, 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 I don't know if it'll translate. We'll, they need we'll a magic see. and a bird, so maybe they can get Angel Reese to be the 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 magic to her bird, or vice versa, and we can uh, yeah, or nice or or Juju Watkins, who's a lot more fun to watch at USC, and she's a t- freshman, so maybe that wouldn't line up. But yeah, no, that you're right. The magic and bird, the NBA, nobody's. The, the NBA finals famously were on tape delay before matching. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that something? Yeah. So, so anyway, all right. Well, thanks for giving me your thoughts there. You made some really, you had some good insight, and I appreciate that. Opening day Friday. Looking forward to seeing you. But we need to take one more quick break, and then come back with our favorite thing. Sound good? All right. We'll be right back with more free press sports with Carlson Shaw. Welcome back to Free Press Sports with Carlson Sean Carlson. It's that time of the show where we talk about our favorite thing, and Helena decided to stick around for this because we want to know what amuses her, what fills her heart, what opens up her soul, so to speak. You know what I mean? So tell us, Helena, what's your favorite thing been in your life from the last week? Well, you know what? I was going to tie it back to what Carlos said about living in Colombia and say that first sip of coffee in the morning is absolutely one of my favorite things where wherever I am on the road or at home I love coffee I love that first sip of, of coffee. that's great but what's your what is your coffee of choice now we have to ask that and when you're on the road you're stuck with stupid k-cups so what do you what do you drink at home what do you drink on the road what I, I like illy coffee a lot I don't want to sound like I'm being sponsored by anybody but <laughs> I do like I do like and I just drink it black well, the, okay. Well, let me ask you this. You were in Tampa recently. The Wings had one of their more critical wins of this stretch, the huge one, actually. But did you or have you been over to Ybor City and had gone into the Cuban bakeries to get a little guava pastry and the Cuban coffee? No, but I did enjoy while I was in on the other side of the state when they played the Florida Panthers, being near enough to the ocean. So, okay, I'll, that could be my favorite thing of the last week is Sunday, Easter, Easter Sunday, Waking up early and, and watching the the sunrise over the the ocean with a cup of coffee. All right, so I'll tie it all together. Okay, I there made we myself go. a cup of coffee, there we go. and I went down to the ocean and watched the sunrise. That was oh. that was a beautiful way to start a day. Okay, we took a minute to get there, but that that's a really nice. <laughs> that's what that's we're looking really, for. <laughs> that's a really nice. Uh, that's a nice picture. That's a nice picture to imagine. All right, how about you, Carlos? All right. Mine is kind of tied to the food a little bit, but mine is about, it's really about giving up, Sean, and understanding who you are as a person later in life. And I I, I don't know if you watch this show. It's really popular on TV, on YouTube called Hot Ones. It's about getting celebrities to eat a bunch of hot sauces. And then basically they, they almost kill, they almost die of, of spice inhalation. So it's really fun. There's a really good host named Sean Evans. And he interviews them while they're pitching whatever it is and they're drinking, eating these hot sauces. Well, Sean had a new one, had David Blaine, the magician on, 
and he gets to this new hot sauce called Pico Rico, P-I-K-O-R-I-K-O. It's a peri-peri hot sauce. And he tastes it and he says, wow. The host says, this might be in my Hall of Fame. And this guy's had a ton of hot sauce. I'm like, all right, I got to order this. This sounds really good. I, I like hot sauce. So I try it. And almost immediately, I start hicking up, doing hiccups and not being almost almost had to get rid of it in a, if you know what I mean, I'm coughing, my eyes are watering, I have to clear my, you know, and, and having Mexican heritage, it's especially embarrassing to me that I should be able to handle more of this stuff. And I will tell you this, if you're interested in trying it, they do always show the Scoville level, which means the, the heat index for all the different spices, right? All the hot sauces. So as a comparison, I looked this up, Tabasco sauce, Frank's Red Hot, about 450 on the Scoville level, really low. Tabasco to 2,500, uh, Cholula 3,600. This one's 15,000 on the Scoville level, which doesn't even approach some of the hotter ones. They get into the millions for them. But I thought I can handle this. I think, and I, and I just couldn't handle it, Sean. And I think it's just time to accept that even though there are, I've looked it up, there are possible ways to build your tolerance. I can't do it. And I'm giving up. And I think, I think I'm tapping out around Cholula. I'm, I'm a Cholula kind of guy maybe Tabasco. And I think I'm going to be happy for it because I'm going to not have so many digestive problems when I'm trying to eat some hot food. So I know that's a disappointment to you, Sean, because you, there's a certain expectation for me to be able to handle hot food, but I give up and I'm going to no. join Helena on the beach one day with some, with some, by the way, I've had Cuban coffee and uh, it was awful. I couldn't take it. I tried. I really wanted to, since I saw it on Miami Vice one time, a long time ago. And uh, I know the Cubans like it, but uh, it's not my thing. But maybe I'll try it again. Maybe the next time I see Helena on the beach somewhere, we'll we'll have a Cuban coffee in there. Yeah, in that we, first we, round against the Florida Panthers. Yes, yes. There you go. They put they like to put the condensed milk in it. You know, it makes it. It's almost like a dessert coffee. It's like or a, so, it's like or a have, have you ever had Turkish coffee? Because, I have. Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, that's funny. No, that's I have no expectation with you and heat. I'm, I'm trying not to assume just because of your your roots, your heritage that you. You're at 50,000 on the skull scale or whatever, you know what I mean? I, I, I would never make that assumption. But I do enjoy when somebody accepts something of themselves. And just and so that's that's because it brings a, a relative peace. And I want you to and I want you to have relative peace, you know, so to speak. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. My favorite thing is I was at Little Caesars Arena Sunday afternoon for a regional final and and as you guys know, and, and you've both been around in the business a long time, whatever a city, and in, in 20 years ago, whatever, in our business, you work for a sports department in a, in a big newspaper, and the an event comes to town, and there are no local teams in it, you still cover it. Similar, I mean, we used to cover it almost like you had a local team. You know, the Detroit had a Final Four. Actually, last time Detroit had a Final Four, Michigan State played in it, so that's not a great example. Detroit had a Super Bowl with the Steelers and the Seahawks played, and we had half the staff there. But we don't really do that anymore because there are so many other outlets and our readers can you, you don't necessarily want that. So in, so we we had this long, not long, but we had this sort of debate, should we go, what should we write about? And I, I thought, all right, I'm just going to go down because Purdue may be playing there on Sunday, and they're in the Big Ten, and I can find at least a somewhat of a local angle with the Big Ten and the national championship. The Big Ten hadn't won a basketball cha- championship since State did in 2000. So I go down there, and I know a little bit. About, I've seen Purdue play a few times this year, and I know a little bit about their history. And, uh, you know, they had been the Final Four in 44 years. And last year, as a number one seed, they were upset by a 16 seed, the only second team that that's ever happened. And in any case, so I thought, all right, there's there's some stuff to write about. We we need to be we need to be there at least at least once. So I go, and I've never heard that much noise in the Little Caesars Arena. Not for not for a hockey game, and obviously not for a Pistons Pistons game. It was crazy, and it just and you know, I was sitting courtside, and just the way the noise rose up and then sort of washed back down. My ears were ringing. I went back at halftime to use the restroom, and I, my ears were ringing. Literally, I couldn't hear. Like, this is really something. So it just made me think: the Wings make a playoff run. God forbid the Pistons ever get into a playoff or even just play a big regular season game when they're good against a big name team that comes in. That arena is going to be a great, great place to watch an event. It's going to be really, really something. And now, look, the Purdue fan was probably 90% Purdue fans 
and they were starved. So it was a starving fan base, and everybody was they were all crying at the end, and that was that was really something too to see all that. Just how much it means, and maybe how much we take that for granted around here with Michigan, Michigan State. They've been in all these uh, Final Fours, I think. 10 of them between the two schools in the last couple of decades. Purdue's been waiting almost 50 years. So that that was an interesting perspective, too, because Purdue's been a good program. But anyway, that noise was unbelievable for our teams if they ever get there. Helena, can you, when we're done with this, can you email Sean a MapQuest uh, map for the press box for the hockey games and have him yeah. come for a Wings-Maple Leafs game so that he can experience what... Uh, what loudness is? Well, come uh, come on Sunday. No, I'm going to come Tuesday, but but I was there not that long ago, and they were on well, a weekend. Roll. Games always have extra atmosphere to them. I, in my I opinion, was there. But, I was yeah. there on a. I was there with you on a Sunday or Saturday, and they won, and it was huge, and it was really yeah. loud, and it was full. And it but was, you're also it, sitting way up, you know. That, in a that makes game. A, that not, makes a difference, yeah. and there are fewer fans for hockey than for basketball because the rink's a lot bigger than the court. So, so that makes a little bit of a difference too. But it was just. It was just like, God, this building, the acoustics in this building. Yeah, no, it was loud when I was there for the wings. I've been there for that. But it's th- this was different. And By I the way, thought, yeah. I had a, yeah. I have a friend who's a, a big, you know, Eagles fan, you know. And he went to, they had a concert at Little Caesars a few years ago, two, three years ago or something. And he said he was blown away by the acoustics. I haven't seen a music act there, but he said it was, and he goes to a lot of concerts, but just for this specific one, he said it was, it was amazing. So you're right, Sean. Probably the acoustics would be amazing on in the playoff. It would be, yeah. And, and I heard some people that are in a lot of basketball arenas just saying they, they, they just hadn't heard anything like that loud in a while. And it was interesting. It took a couple out of town teams, but but to to do that. But in any case, it was it was cool. I mean, it was a, it was fun to watch that fan base, you know, be rewarded after all these years and just all that emotion. But they had, it was cool to be able to watch. And I was writing, but it's not the same as when you're writing about one of your own teams, right? So you can, you're, you're, you step uh, back a little bit. Did you hear any Jared Goff chants? No, I did not. No, you have to go to a Wings game to hear those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if the Pistons ever drew, they might chant for Goff there too, right? <laughs> maybe. I mean, maybe. No, no, maybe. Anyway. No, it was just, it was, it was quite the scene. For a while, I forgot I was in Detroit. Thought you were in West Lafayette. Yeah, or just somewhere out in the country at a, at a yeah, it was it was something. But anyway, that was my favorite thing. All right, Carlos, we need to thank Elena for joining us today. Yeah, and I'll be back in two weeks to set up the first round of the playoffs. Perfect. That sounds great, you guys. Yeah, that sounds great. I hope they get in. I hope it's Florida. I hope. Yeah, because like Carlos and I are going to be having Cuban You can coffee. show. Yes, you can show. Take Carlos to Ybor City. Or to beach, you know. Take well, that's a little far from Florida, but from where the Florida Panthers play. But oh, oh, you're right. You're right. Our drive thing. No, you're right. Well, take them down to South Beach. It's not that far. Show them around. Yeah, Cuban coffee. Go. Cuban coffee. Bring your suit. I'm always wearing the suit, Sean. I never take it off. Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Elena. It's always great to have you. My pleasure, anytime and always. All right, Carlos. Who do we need to thank? Well, Helena, obviously, it's. Always great to have her. It's nice to talk some hockey. I know you think uh, I don't like hockey. I like hockey a lot. You know, I just I'm just not as in tune a lot with is the, a strong uh, word, my friend. You no, know, with I, I didn't say I loved it. They're they're very they're they're degrees here. They're degrees. I guess, here. Yeah, no, I, tells you I like you a lot. That's that's a different. Yeah, then I love you. No, yeah. I, what 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 I I love playoff hockey and I and I love in person playoff hockey. That's that's great. That's what I'll say for but sure. You love in any case, basketball. Well, yeah, and, and tennis and What do you like more, baseball and, or hockey? Which in one do person, you dis- dislike? In person, in person in or person, on TV? Covering In it, person, yeah. I like hockey more. Like hockey more. I mean, I think a lot of people would, right? It's just the action. The, more the way more the, baseball fans than hockey fans, but yeah. The speed, yeah. The baseball games, people love going to baseball games for very different reasons. And no, it's a great in-person sport, too. More romantic, Much I guess. Family, all that. All right. Anyway, the point is, it's great to have Felina, and we got an interesting couple of weeks here to finish up the hockey season. We need to finish this podcast, so and we need to thank thank some people. I want to thank you for you know allowing us to do this. I mean, it's your name up there, so thank you for letting me be part of your podcast. I want to thank the listeners. Obviously, the main reason we do this, we want to thank who Kirkland Crawford, our sports editor, Nicole, and Anjanette. 
and who else am I missing? Are you, are they just like <laughs> what is it? Mono? No, we want to thank our or... editor, Anjanet no, Delgado and Nicole Avery Nichols. Or, or exactly, I was just about Queens to say of that. the Free Press who run everything. Yeah, they, they run everything. We want to thank them, and then obviously Robin Chan, the, the guy who makes this possible. The king, the king. He is the king. He's our boss. He's had a little bit of an attitude lately, which I oh, like. You he's know, throwing he's, us. He's get, the, 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 we won't get into the sausage stuff, but man, he's been ordering me, ordering us around. You're doing no, this it's great. That, it's e- it's easier that way. It's just easier to be told what to do. Yeah, I find absolutely. It really, it, it really is. We're, just, we're leaning into it. We're in good hands with him, and obviously the podcast is not possible without him. You can find us wherever you find your favorite podcast: Apple, Spotify. Please subscribe to our show. Let us know what you think. Rate us. Let us. I don't know. You can say whatever you want on the ratings. That's what they're there for. It's like the comment section used to be in our newspaper. I guess that was moderated a little bit. But in any case, thanks for listening. And we'll be back next week. Right, Carlos? All right. With more Free Press Sports with Carlos and Johnson.